go. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Joe Armstrong and the Power Systems Virtual User Group for January 2021. Um, pretty exciting. And uh, just want to say a Happy New Year. I know it's kind of getting on into the year, but Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of, well, we thought a lot of political things were behind us. Maybe some more are still coming up. Uh, the pandemic is still with us. Uh, travel is still severely limited or non-existent. Uh, so it's pretty much like 2020 so far, um, hopefully on demand though, and we're getting better. So I hope everyone's doing well. Um, a couple of things here before we get started. One, uh, I did hit the record button, so we are recording this session. Um, two, the presentation materials are out on the wiki, and um, I'll throw a thing into the wiki, uh, a link in there here pretty soon uh, when we get going. But the presentation materials are out there. There's actually, we're doing, as you know, uh, as I said in the emails I sent, two different sessions um, with uh, our speakers, Earl and Tom, today. So it, what we've done is take three presentations, um, combine them, and split them sort of into two sessions. Not sure where the split's actually going to happen. Depends on uh, how Earl goes through this. He'll just stop when we run out of time, I suppose. And um, so uh, all the presentation materials for all three sessions that we're covering are in the January um, part of the wiki. So you can go there and see all those. And when I add, I haven't added February yet since I haven't set up that webinar, but when I do, I'll just kind of put a link down or point it to them somehow. So you all be able to find them. But you should be able to download them now. Um, with that, let's go ahead and get on to uh, the actual uh, introduction of what we're gonna talk about. So as I said, we've got Earl Jew um, on today and Tom Prokop, both of them. And uh, if you've been on the, a member of the bug for a while, you've heard Earl, or if you've been to TechU or several other things, or maybe even have Earl in to your business, um, he presents very deep uh, performance tuning uh, and knowledge of how AIX and power systems are working way down deep. Just gives you a real, uh, insight into how things work, and that helps you to better tune your systems, know what's happening, and, and deal with them. So as I said, we've got three different um, sessions uh, that we're covering, and I'm actually going to let Earl talk a little bit more about them, um, all kinds of things on how AIX is using CPU, memory, um, I.O., um, how threads are mapped, um, what that means when your system's running, and maybe uh, what you have to do to uh, make your system run a little bit better um, with all that, and then also um, the third one on um, statistics, and if you've seen Earl before, sometimes he throws out some long numbers and they look kind of like, well, what does that mean? But you start counting digits and Earl helps us understand what these numbers mean and what and what it says about how the system is running. So uh, pretty excited to hear all about that. Um, I hope you have your thinking caps on. Earl throws a lot of information really fast. Um, Tom is going to be, I think, mostly in the background answering questions that are typed in, but he might chime in as well. Uh, Earl's asked us to keep him honest. That's probably not such a big worry, but um, we'll try and uh, make it so that everything, uh, all the questions are answered and, and everything's understandable as well. So uh, with that, you know, uh, Earl, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Joe, that was, you introduced uh, the strategic content already. This first session, a tactical dissection. This is anatomy. A tactical dissection means tactical, what you see with your hands on the keyboard with a putty login session. That's what I mean by tactical. Versus strategic, with just groups of high-level ideas. Tactical means something you can do, something you can see. Six sessions I presented at TechU last October. We're going to only do three of these. Uh, the next session is the mapping AIX process threads and evaluating cumulative statistics. These sessions are being recorded so you can replay them so I can speak quickly and clearly and you can keep replaying over phrases if you care to. So I'm not going to slow it down. This is meant as an overview because we're going to more deeply address um, contents introduced here in uh, the subsequent sessions. Uh, as you see here, this is the second session. That's why it says four subsequent sessions. 
That top one, Practical Essentials, I've given the essence of that earlier uh, in earlier VUG uh, events. So I'm skipping it. Okay. CPU nomenclature. Six layers. I devised this by deconstructing a parent AIX. This is not based on a documented reference from within IBM. This is based on this is based on what I see when I watch AIX. Uh, there are no references offering this structure breakdown, so I had to conjure this. This gives us a lattice work for how to see CPU processing. Without this understanding, I believe it's very difficult to navigate tuning. First two layers, pretty intuitive. Layer zero, you buy the hardware, comes with PowerVM, the hypervisor. Layer one, you build the LPAR and boot it. So those two layers are a gimme. Next two layers. Layer two is the CPU virtual CPU folding mechanism of PowerVM. And layer three, seeding. These two layers actually, to me, is the power of PowerVM. These two layers are CPU efficiency events of Power VM is for the sake of efficiency. This is why we're able to virtualize so much over so few cores. These two layers are essential understanding. They do not slow performance. Where we're going to dive into is layer four. When a virtual CPU is served by a core. This is bluntly screaming the reality that virtual CPUs are not always served by a core. Now, most of us tune by viewing AIX all by its lonesome. Of course, there's a hypervisor between the hardware and AIX. The reality is virtual CPUs are not always served by a core. When a virtual CPU is served by a core, despite what you see from AIX, your virtual CPU is not always served by a core. When it is served by a core, it dispatches logical CPUs that are hardware threads of the core. You can read it to say right here, logical CPUs can execute workload, wait for workload, and to execute workload, they're dispatched to or undispatched from the hardware threads of the core a new reality, ILCS, VLCS, and LCS. LCS stands for logical context switch, but it really should be pronounced logical CPU context switch. And then the last layer, layer five here, is the deepest layer. I presented this years earlier, and that went over like a lead balloon. I think I went too deep, uh, but I think Gareth might be interested. <laughs> All right, so all this is derived by a parent uh, AIX output. This is the reality we can tune to. This is the reality we can see. What's really going on on the core itself behind the hypervisor? I can't see. I can't know. All we can do is tune by a parent AIX. Now, we do have performance monitoring unit in the Power 9 and 24-7 utility, those guys can see what's going on beyond there uh, underneath the hypervisor. Um, I can't, and we can't really tune by it. And, all right, five factors. And if you're wondering, yes, I spent two hours looking for a Game of Thrones figure with five people in it. Five factors. We all understand. I think we all understand. The power servers comprise of cores on SRADs, processor chips, that are, you know, directly linked to its local DIMM memory. And we've got four sets of these SRAD DIMM sets per CAC, controlled by PowerVM in the kernel. And here's the big one, to map and migrate threads to logical CPUs for execution. I have two colors there. We see the pink. The reality of execution is in the blue. Knowing how everything works in your place will help you to improve dot, 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 performance efficiency. Performance efficiency is continuum. It's a spectrum, and I define it. 
performance, enough entitlement, efficiency, the least entitlement. And there are numbers associated with the definition. I present the concept, and in other presentations, I give you the definitions in real numbers. That's what tuning is. Understanding numbers and making decisions. Most of us, though, in the Powerverse, tune by best practices. Sorry, best practices is not tuning. Best practices is a first good guess. Tuning is watching the workload and making decisions. Tom, you chip in here anytime. The next continuum is responsiveness throughput. Now, this is a big deal. Responsive throughput is based on exploiting SMT. And the terrible thing is the practices regarding responsive throughput were based at the beginning at Power 5, Power 6 at SMT2. Most of our understanding and practices, whether you give it these words or not, is based on SMT2 and la-di-da, Power 9, Power 10, we are default SMT8. So what we used to base these two qualities upon has now gone to SMT8 and it changes everything. And then the last one. Knowing how everything above works and interplace will help you improve performance efficiency, response to the throughput when deploying only the needed count of software CPU licenses. I don't know why this is true, but a lot of customers buy 20 licenses and find they're only using five, and you paid for 15 extra software CPU licenses you didn't need to pay for. I think I might be on a hit list for our software CPU uh, license salesman. Um, if you only need five, you only use five. Why are you guys buying 20? I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. So, Bill, if I could interject for a second. Yes, please. Yeah, so this is Tom. So a lot of the workloads you're running likely have a history of starting out on, say, a Power 6 or a Power 7, maybe in some cases all the way back to Power 4 and 5, and you've moved them forward to Power 8, Power 9. But oftentimes the underlying setup of those images and the software code and the SMT levels didn't keep up with the changes in the architecture. And so you probably have some inherent inefficiencies in there that you may not even know of. Service level agreements are being met because the strength of the core is great. But what Earl's pointing out is that you may be wasting a lot of money running a system that's not running efficiently and the biggest cost you may have in a lot of cases is those real expensive software licenses. So this is a way to go in and look at these systems, especially the, the big ones, the important ones that are chewing up lots of cores, and say, am I spending a bunch of money on licenses that I don't need to? And can I save a lot of money by doing some simple things? I think Earl's going to point out some interesting things that might surface that for you, give you some tools. Thank you, Tom. That does explain some things. So those are the five factors. These five factors are all interrelated along the two power SMT continuums. What are these continuums? Well, I stated them already. Performance efficiency response to the throughput. What I mean by continuum is if you want high performance, you're going to have lower efficiency. If you want great efficiency, you can have lower performance. Same thing with responsive throughput. This is actually defined. This continuum of response to the throughput was actually introduced in 2013 for Power 7. Huh, what? Well, Tom, you can help me verify the history of this. These are the default SMT modes for power 5 onto power 10. So the question should be, has there been an ever-growing role of SMT in workload processing? Well, I say the answer is yes, there's an ever-growing role, but nobody seems to know how to exploit it, and everyone just accepts it by default, 
And, uh, yeah, without doubt, it's growing. But what about versus our traditional best practices? Our traditional IT best practices are CPU is never enough and it's always too slow. That's our assumption. That's why all of the monitoring tools are focused on how busy the CPU is, all CPUs. My twist of rule here for the Powerverse is, in general, almost every LPAR in the Powerverse has so much CPU, we are challenged to keep them busy. CPU now is so fast and so vast, we are challenged to give them work to do. That's a problem. The whole equation is flipped over. Is there a guide for deployment of SMT and workload processing? Yeah, well, most people, the guide is you accept as a fault. Um, I'm going to address that a little further. And what are the differences between the three SMT modes? Yeah, I guess there's SMT1 also. Well, I'm gonna answer that last one first. This next session is about Power 9 SMT248. From the AIX perspective, uh, Power 9 SMT248. Power 9 SMT248 is very different from Power 7, Power 8. Why? The core microarchitecture is vastly revamped to slices on Power 9. Okay? The reason why I had to write this presentation is those four percentages, CPU percentages, well, maybe you never noticed, but all four of those numbers on each line, when you add them up, should add up to 100. Sometimes it's 99 for rounding error. Those are percentages. And they better be consistent to 100 for those four. So we're going to talk about those percentages and how they have been different in their meaning and understanding from Power 7, Power 8 to Power 9. On Power 9, this is a big deal. On Power 9, we ignore the KTHR run queue. Yeah, yeah, I know. On Power 7 and Power 8, I told you how to monitor that and its meaning. You can't do that with any reliability any longer on Power 9 because the core is so different. When I first saw Power 9, that number in the R column was huge, and all the numbers were completely alien to me, and I finally had to decipher why. And instead of it watching KTHR, we monitor user plus system. The reason why we cannot reliably understand KTHRR anymore is because, and this is for Gareth and all of you, is because the L1 instruction cache and the instruction buffer in every individual core has more than doubled, is probably quadrupled. They won't tell me how big it is, but now the instructions in the core, the buffers, are huge. All of you can think of an Altoid box, right? It, it, Think of an Altoid box, you know, the Altoid box. You, you have so many instructions in that Altoid box. And those are the instructions executing in the core. Well, that instruction buffer in the core is no longer an Altoid box. It's more akin to the size of a Kleenex tissue box. Now it holds more instructions. Well, that's good. Because in Power 8, that instruction buffer, from what they tell me, it was so small we emptied it out all the time, and now the core sat there, and when I ran out of instructions, hey, gee, what the hell am I going to do? So on Power 9, and this is a real story, on Power 9, they made that instruction so big. Now the core never runs out of instructions, but it changed KTHRR, because when AIX puts those instructions to the core, AIX says, they are executing. Well, yeah, they are executing, except that in the core, there's a big tissue box holding all those instructions. So AIX thinks they're executing, but they're mostly sitting in the instruction buffer in the core. That's why I can't use that number anymore. 
Well, if I can't use that number, I had to come up with tuning tactics, and that's what I'm presenting here. We monitor our only user per system. You can look at the you can look at the run queue fine, but point is is that to monitor how busy you are, you monitor user plus system percentage of work on Power Nine. Practices I gave you for Power Seven and Eight, yeah, they're fine, but on Power Nine, the hardware is different. Here's the problem, guys. AIX has mostly looked like AIX from 4.3.3 on on to today. The numbers all look the same. That that's good because once you learn AIX, you know AIX, and it just carries on. Um, I gotta ask you guys: since Power Four, did the hardware change a little bit? Yeah. Tuning is a full stack perspective, from the core to the cache to the interconnect on the SRAD to the interconnect on the frame. I mean, it's a full stack awareness, including the hypervisor. What we've been doing, and some of you can protest this, but what we've been doing is mostly tuning by our favorite sexy tools and LPART RD and whatever else you have, and that is an AIX perspective only. User per system, and you see the gauge chart there on the left. User per system is actual productive workload. And it scales from zero to 100%. Okay, processor consume 1.0, that's per virtual CPU. And this slide came to me from Patrice, who is on and listening right now. Patrice wonderfully sent me an update to the graphics, and I spent all day. Thanks, Patrice, for the new graphic. That there is the scale of user plus system, and this is what Patrice shared with me yesterday and kept me busy. Let's break down what Patrice sent on Power9 here. We are now SMT8 default. So there's SMT8, that wonderful chart there. And you see all the colors. Let's, we're going to know this real good here, so don't, don't, uh, don't, don't worry yourself too much here. When I say user plus system equals 33, I also mean that idle and wait is 67 because they're an inverse. What's 33% is always idle 67 because they add up to 100. Or 2 times 33 and then 34 and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's how user plus system adds up and the inverse is idle and wait. So when I talk about user plus system and we look at the numbers on this chart, I'm looking at that column and I hope this helps. We're monitoring user plus system. Those of you who attended TechU October and I presented this, you'll see there's a market change here because Patrice gave me a new graphic. Thank you, Patrice. Whoa! You mean user per system maps to ranges? Useful ranges? Yeah. Let's use user per system and ignore the KTHR run queue because the hardware differences has forced this tactical change on me. Of course, idle and wait is the inverse. And so we have this. This is exactly the same as that. Okay? So that's how we map the graphic to the reality that we monitor. All right? This has been recorded. You have the PowerPoint. I've written the PowerPoint. Dominic, I don't know how to spell the word Lunix. I don't know about Lunix. That's a Tom and Joe question. All right. Hard SMT. What's that yellow down there, hard SMT? Well, that's my shorthand for saying this is the max SMT mode setting. Okay, the max SMT mode setting. And you can see that we have four different max SMT mode settings. We are now SMT8 by default. So I call that hard SMT8 by default. And soft SMT1 means 
hey, your maximum SMT mode is SMT8, but in reality, you're running at mostly SMT1. Hard, soft. This is acknowledging that our SMT modes are constantly changing. Each individual virtual CPU on the core can be independently in a different SMT mode at any instantaneous moment. He's just talking about averages here. But I'll get hey, to Earl, that. Yes. Tom here. Yep. There's a lot of questions in the chat here about, gee, should I, basically, should I set my SMT level to a 2 or a 4 or an 8, depending on workload, et cetera? And this, I think, could be a good time to talk about in what cases would you actually set the SMT hard to be other than 8 in a power 9 versus letting the system decide based upon the workload that's presented to the cores and let it vary at the soft SMT from 1 to 8. Can you comment on that? Yeah. I have a whole lecture at it, and Tom knows it. SMT8 is wonderful in getting throughput out for batch workloads. Batch workloads are wonderful um, at SMT8 because SMT8 gives us the most throughput. That's why SMT8 is great, except that when we deployed SMT8 in the Powerverse, we got a problem. SMT8 renders the highest throughput available to you to exploit, but if you don't give it an SMT8 workload, it will not give you the high throughput of SMT8. What? As I stated initially, we are challenged to put workload to our cores to use them. If you have an SMT8 batch workload that you want the highest throughput on, put an SMT8 workload to the core. What do you guys do? You got too many virtual CPUs and everything's running at SMT1, SMT2, and then a minor SMT4 and not sustaining at SMT8. Oh, well, we give you SMT8, but if you don't give a workload to the core that's SMT8, it's not going to give you the output, throughput of SMT8. SMT8 to be blunt. Should be exploited for batch workloads only. Now, if you have an OLTP workload, which is the next, well, somewhere in my sessions, your OLTP workloads like the lower SMT modes. Why? Well, SMT2 divides the core in two, meaning each thread runs on a half of the SMT8 core. If you divide the thread, if you divide the core less with lower SMT modes, each thread will run longer in a given interval. The definition of throughput is not defined. Not well defined, at least I can find it. So I had to conjure it here. Throughput is eight threads running concurrently in the same 10 millisecond interval, meaning no part of that core is wasted doing nothing. For those who ask this question, I have a whole strategy based on it. But I am supposed to preach SMT8 default. And that's what I'm doing here. There are exceptional circumstances for SMT2. No circumstances on Power9 for SMT1. Obviously, though, if you are in lower SMT modes, you will need more virtual CPUs on cores to match the same thread count. SMT8 is wonderful for throughput, and you can use SMT8 for OLTP. But when you have extreme responsive needs, there are other tactics you need to deploy. I don't want to give away my thunder too early here. I'm just getting started. But yes, we have a good option. No SMT1 on Power9 ever. But you can have a hard SMT2, a hard SMT4. Most workloads will run just fine at SMT8. 
And the moral of that little story is the hardest thing I've had to teach the Powerverse since 2012 is to get you guys to reduce your virtual CPUs. That's the nastiest thing to have too many virtual CPUs, especially at SMT8. And my last VUG presentation showed that up. I hope that's good enough for now, guys. Soft SMT1, soft 2, and you can see the numbers. Soft 4, and you can see you can run three threads or four threads at SMT4, so there's two towers. And soft 8, you can run five, six, seven, or eight threads concurrently at soft 8 on hard SMT8. And that's how the numbers map. Thank you, Patrice. Patrice, he's on. You can comment in chat if he wants. But he actually ran tests to establish these percentages. And uh, he makes me look better than I am. Thank you. Oh, Patrice is in France, so he speaks French too. Right. So idle and wait, 67%. Inverse is 33. So when you see 33, you assume 67. It has to be. And that's what 33 means. It means 33% means all virtual CPUs are at SMT1 folded up in a one-second interval. Now, this is not precise and certifiably defined. This is in the absence of no, in the absence of any understanding of the numbers, this works. When you look at it, you're looking at a one second average, well guys, one second in power nine or power seven power is a very long time. It's a very long time because our CPUs are fast, but also next we have so many of them. Which is why I do all monitoring for performance tuning versus capacity planning for performance tuning in one second. So in one second, that means all virtuals follow up at SMT1 and I said one second, not one minute, not one hour, not one day. One second only. Same thing with user per system at 66%. It means all virtuals at SMT2 mode in a one second interval. 74% breaks into the beginning range of SMT4. 87 breaks into the beginning range of SMT8. So these numbers have meaning and they break at 33, 66, 74, and 87 percent. And I have Patrice to prove to me it is so. He sent me the script and I looked at it and went, wow, he done did it. Okay? I don't know why IBM doesn't offer these. They used to. Um, thank you, Patrice. Well, what about those percentages in between? Between 33 and 66. Well, those are ranges of a proportional blend over a second. It means all of your virtual CPUs are either SMT1 or SMT over the second. If it's closer to 33%, you got more SMT1 versus SMT2. If it's closer to 66%, you've got more in SMT2 and a little SMT1. It is a proportional blend. This is how we understand the numbers. A portion of blend between two and four, and four and eight. And if your user per system is 87% and higher, you're all SMT8. Now that's doesn't mean eight threads per eight logicals. It means most of the cores are in SMT8 mode with five, six, seven, or eight threads running on them in a one second interval. Tom, how are they doing in chat? Well, I guess I could look. Doing pretty good, Earl. Um, oh, okay. I think the answer though, the SMT question part, uh, one question was, is it possible to tell what, what the SMT, you know, if, if it's changing dynamically, is it possible to monitor what it is? It the, is. The it is. That's the next session. 
All right, so all five factors. Two continuums. These two continuums have grown broader because of SMT8. It's a big statement. These continuums have grown broader with SMT8, yet our back practices, our present practices, are based on SMT2. Guys, there's a big difference between practices SMT2 and using SMT2 practices and putting it up on SMT8. Guys, we need to evolve to the hardware. The hardware is evolving faster than we are able to exploit it, and that's a problem. That's not tuning. That is our lack of evolution. Like I said, evolve the wetware to the technology. Is there an ever-growing role of SMT? Yeah. Well, let, let me prove it. This is Power 9. And we, you know, Power 9 came out 2017 to present. That's Power 9. And when we talk about SMT, we think about, well, when, when did SMT first emerge? That's not SMT. I'm till x86. Well, I, I guess they came out with they came out with hyperthreading in 2004. Wait a second, Joe, Tom, Intel is hyperthreading continuously since 2002 and today until today. There's no SMT8 on 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 Intel. Really? Well, uh, they stop it. They don't have any hyperthreading anymore? They have no SMT? Well, anyways, this is what they tell me that Intel is right now. And this is where we are now at Power 9, SMT8. And where did we begin? Well, you know, Power 5 came out with SMT2. But in 2007, there's Power 6. And those are the same graphic numbers for SMT2. Thank you, Patrice. Power 7 and SMT4. And power eight with SMT four and an exposure of SMT eight. And this is what we are now. Well, what do you think the future is going to look like? What is going to go on beyond S power nine? Uh, I get a, I get, a, I, I get a sense that. Linux on Intel is going to look about the same because the inertia is they're not looking like they're going to come out with SMT8. They're still hyper-threading. Joe, am I speaking truth on this? It looks, by the way, Joe used to, Joe used to architect and design CPUs. You probably forgot all that, Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, you're kind of stretching it there for me, Earl. But <laughs> as far as I know, you're, you're still right on, on the Intel thing here. And, uh and no, no, of no. course, on the power. Intel, okay? All right. Yeah, so it doesn't look like they're uh, progressing. And what do we look like in the future? Uh, I don't think we know what Power 10 is going to look like. But I'm going to guess that Power 10 and its curves and numbers and tiles and colors are going to be same similar to Power 9. So this is what their future is, and this already exists. I just haven't seen it yet. What I am watching right now, though, is I'm watching them design Power 11. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I, I hope I'm not. I hope I'm still around for Power 11. So we got this to look forward to, and I've got Power 10 to, to write about. Okay. So has there been an ever-growing role of SMT in workload processing? Well, if you're in the Powerverse, that answer is yes. If you're not in the power verse, you're on that Intel stuff, um, the answer is no. This is what really distinguishes the power verse from those other alternate universes. What are all those differences between Power 9 and SMT 248? I just presented that above. Any guide to the deployment of SMT in workload processing? Well, my guess at that is, no, there isn't. Oh, come back when you can, Tom. Sorry to lose you. <clears throat> no, good. 
So any guide to deployment SMT? I don't believe there is. So this next session is that guide to deployment of SMT. To answer those who had the foresight to ask earlier, here it is. OLTP transaction responsiveness. You see, I say strategically, every workload has to have a gender. Oops. Don't get mad at me, social justice warriors. I'm just saying that workloads... Joe, I hope you... Okay. I say that workloads should be either response time, OLTP, to find gender, or a batch throughput to find gender. That you need to choose if your LPAR does both, which one takes prominence, which one's the priority. Here's my beef. Guys, argue with me on this. I believe our best practices are founded on the assumption of a throughput-oriented batch workload. I believe our best practices and defaults assumes a batch workload, and no wonder I have so many engagements on OLTP performance slow responsiveness cases because they build out a best practice LPAR, put an OLTP workload on it, and it doesn't run very well until I get my hands on it. I believe best practices assumes the batch workload and not every workload is a batch workload. So you build out a best practices LPAR, you run your transactions, they run real slow and they go, what the heck's going on here? That's why I'm teaching this. Everything's based on, on this here, Neil Rudnick's ch chart that he shared with me. Unfortunately, or not, I don't know if it's unfortunate or not, but Neil retired about two weeks ago. I, I, I wish him the best. OLTP work, okay, so this chart here talks about SMT 1, 2, 4, 8, and response time is very short and fast up here, and response time goes down here. And, of course, the throughput improves. So well, you have a 300% improvement in throughput, but your response time goes down. Well, I should talk to you about something. All right, OLTP workloads. I believe OLTP workloads all share a universal uniform set of traits. That's what I believe. OLTP workloads are transactional. Probably somebody's waiting. And I believe OLTP workloads persistently care to complete every transaction as quickly as possible. I believe this is intuitive. I believe you all agree. Okay, OLTP workloads usually comprised of clones. So I explain clones here. Clones is all the processes running exactly the same shared pages of executable code. They all look alike, just processing different data. Processes are doing the same thing with different data. Clone processes are often very numerous, smaller, single threaded, short lived, tightly tall. Tightly tall means the process exists and it does nothing. It does nothing. It does nothing. And all of a sudden, bang, it does transactions for one second, very intensely, and then it comes right back down. The next second, does nothing, and does nothing. That's what I mean by tightly tall. Doing nothing, bang, and then right back down in the middle of nothing again. Clone processes are likely executing transactions on the run queue. And that run queue can be chaotic, volatile, coincident, manic, it's crazy. When you talk about OLTP workload, you're dealing with severe volatile chaos of intensity. And the founding note about OLTP workloads is you better have core capacity to always be reserved for that volatile run queue, meaning you have a hell out of CPU waiting around just to be used. And that range of intensity is what you must be able to monitor and tune for. Because all TP workloads are not your very consistently humdrum batch workloads. All right? So those are all the traits and what we care about, having enough core capacity all the time and you need to acknowledge volatility. Very different. So we go back to this chart, Raniel. 
And when I say OLTP workloads are about responsiveness, wow. I think SMT1, SMT2 has the highest response time, meaning the shortest response time. Why? If you divide the core by one or you divide the core by two, key statement, if you divide the core by one or two, each thread can run longer in a 10 millisecond interval. Bluntly, the definition of responsiveness is running longer in every intervals and thus the transaction completes in fewer overall intervals. This assumes, and it's true, fragmentation of processing duration. What we see at AIX, we believe, when something is executing is running contiguously, it is not running contiguously in reality. The fragmentation of processing duration is highly fragmented at multiple layers. And that's what the next presentation is about. Did you guys know that tuning to the reality is more effective than tuning to the wish? I say the use of the system range 33 to 70 is special at SMT8. As you see here, 33 to 70 says big bold SMT1 and 2 and a small SMT4. This range 33 to 70 is mostly SMT1 and 2, a little bit of SMT4. That SMT4 is likely the kernel. I say that you tune your count of virtual CPUs to run mostly at 33 to 70%. Because therefore you're exploiting SMT1, 2, and some SMT4, and it is a responsive range for executing OLTP threads. Now, you can boot SMT8 and adjust your virtual CPUs to run this range. Or you can just boot hard SMT4, and you're ever always in that range. But the default is SMT8, and that's what I'm supposed to push. So there we go. 33 to 70 at SMT8. Great full LTP. That's SMT1 on Power 9. What? What? Well, Two super slices on the left focus on executing one thread, meaning there's no part of the core not being used. While in SMT1 and SMT8, power 9, we actually power down the other SMT4 core. See, there's two SMT4 cores fused together and blessedly sharing the same L2 cache. And since we power this side down, we can spin the clock cycle up a lot higher here and that's why that one thread runs so fast, but also because we power this down, the prefetch is more aggressive on one thread. SMT2, you use both halves. No part of the core is not used. There is no such thing as an idle core. It's always using all of it. But it's two threads prefetching concurrently. That's great because we run a transaction longer in a 10 millisecond interval, thus response time completes its transactions across fewer intervals. Fragmentation of processing duration is going to be introduced in my next session. All right, batch workloads, throughput. Tom? Any chit-chat chatter? No, Tom, yet? I think, uh, sorry, I was uh, on mute and I had uh, some technical issues with my laptop. Um, I think this is a good slide because it it, it kind of makes concrete the, the core versus the SMT mode that the workload is running at, either SMT hard or soft. I think there still is a bit of confusion based in the chat about 
soft, i.e. what the core is doing based on the workload that's being presented versus hard based upon what you set the SMT level to be. I think just a quick comment on that might be appropriate. Getting a lot yeah, of questions it's on not that. a good comment. Guys, I cannot confirm the reality of the SMT mode of the core. I can only tune from AIX. So we're tuning by apparent AIX in our understanding. What the core is actually doing behind the hypervisor, I can't show you. And I don't like claiming things I can't show you. All I can show you is apparent AIX. I can tell you all kinds of fables and fantasies. But I'm not going to tell you what that core is doing because I can't see it. And if I can't see it, I can't claim it. Uh, is that brutally honest enough, Tom? Yeah, I, I think what's confusing is in the past we've had clients go in and set an SMT mode 2 or 1 or 4 based upon the workload. And on Power 9, we're basically saying leave the SMT hard at 8 and let the system select the SMT mode dynamically at the core level based upon the workload. And then yeah, at well, the same time... Replay my last system. year's bug because it shows, you, it shows you what you don't want to see. Yeah. And then... So here's, well, here's the, the problem. If you had down, SMT hard and you don't give an SMT8 workload to an SMT8 hard LPAR, your processor consumed number is going to be high with a high amount of idle and weight. And that higher PC value is what you're buying licenses for. You just heard the strategic theme of everything. If you're SMT8 and you're not going to put an SMT8 workload to an SMT8 core, you're going to have a higher idle percentage. You know, dog that well, that's true. If you have a higher idle weight percentage, your PC processor consume total is a big old number. That is 40, 50 percent idle. And now you're buying all your cores to that processor consume licenses, that processor consume number, not realizing you bought so many licenses because you're an SMT8 and you have too many SMT8 virtual CPUs. Am I? I don't know if I'm making that point clear. Um, that yeah, flash I could interject. Yeah. I could interject a little. So it, you, you can manage the SMT level. But that doesn't really answer the ultimate question. If you have an SMT2 workload on an SMT8 core and you gave it too many virtual CPUs, they're wasting core capacity. The better thing to do for most workloads is to reduce the virtual CPU count so that you're more efficient with the threads to core ratio. And that's what Earl's getting at. If you had an old SMT2 workload and you had a certain virtual CPU count, you move that over to an SMT8 core, and you didn't change the virtual CPU count, you're likely wasting core resources and costing yourself money. And I think a couple of slides ahead here, you might see some of the numbers that support that. That is my point. Yep. We established at SMT2 and we're SMT8 and we're not evolving. That's not tuning. That's ignorance. All right, batch workloads, throughput. Main point of batch workloads, they don't care about responsiveness. Can you think of a batch workload that cares about responsiveness? I can't think of one. Batch workloads, long duration, non-interactive, periodically repeated, move the data projects. They're long duration, very different from OLTP. They're usually comprised of a variety of larger, longer-lived, multi-threaded clones, and batch workload performance is measured by end-to-end -end execution duration. No concern for responsiveness. I believe our best practices are founded on the assumption of a batch workload. Key point. When execution durations are less critical, important, concerning, batch workloads run on anything. You abuse the heck out of them, they're going to run. 
You starve them for entitlement. They're going to run. You starve them for memory. It's going to run. AIX doesn't crash very easily, guys. So batch workloads, if you've got none about batch workloads, heck, they're going to run. And it's in grave contrast to OLTP workloads. Batch workloads do not require a reserve of core capacity to attend volatility because there's no concern for responsiveness. That's a major statement, Tom. Did I say that one right? Mr. Tom? I, <laughs> I was in the Major midst of Tom? answering a question. And I... I <laughs> I was answering a question, and I, 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 I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an SMT one core, so I can't do two things at once. So that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. that, that's the state of the male brain, Tom. We're okay. <laughs> what I say here is throughput is a measure of processing productivity per perspective. It's perspective per logical, per entitlement, per virtual, and we at IBM are founded on processing productivity per processor consumed at your choice of SMT. This is my definition of throughput, <coughs> and I believe my <coughs> batch workloads, you can run them over in time, and they will run. They'll just take longer to run. <coughs> That's what we care about. Batch workloads, easy to tune, guys. <coughs> so here we are on Neil's chart, batch workloads. It's about understanding the ellipse because the higher you go in SMT mode, the higher is your throughput, but the lower is your responsiveness. This is what I mean by responsiveness throughput continuum. High throughput, low response time. High response time meaning short response time, lower throughput. There's a big jump between SMT1 and SMT2. That 85% is a gain in opportunity exploitation, meaning at SMT1, you're throwing away 85% of the throughput because you're one thread and you've powered down the other side. So that's why SMT2 and SMT4 are favored by me. Well, let's look at SMT4 and SMT8. Between 70 and 95, note that that's not 100%, 100% would be zero idle, 95 is seven threads at SMT8 with one thread running wait to attend the run queue. That's why I say 95. It is a little bit of SMT2, mostly 4 and 8. Means all your virtuals are SMT8 and SMT4 and a little bit of SMT2 in that range. And this is an efficient range for executing batch threads which is right there. At 95, you better not be tighter and higher. That's SMT4. Two threads across two super slices, two threads across super slices, and when one thread stops on an L3 miss, the other thread picks up and keeps on running. That's what throughput's about. And the big shift, remember, this is two threads on two super slices each concurrently. The big jump is right there. That's SMT8. That's two threads per super slice. Very high throughput because all the core is ever absolutely busy. And you have eight concurrent streams in prefetch on eight threads. This is the nature of throughput. Tom, that's probably you who needs to go on mute for a moment. So here are the ranges, 33 to 70 and 70 to 95. There's a cutoff. Right here, Bran, which is workload here in the background, is running a batch workload. Okay. So it's tuned right. And the inverse. This is the inverse of this. 
And because I cannot do arithmetic in my head, it's hard for me to add two two-digit numbers together, so I usually do this, but they both work. I can add a one-digit number to a two-digit number with my socks off, all right? So that's how I, that's what I use, but you do what you want. So is there any guide to deployment of SMT? Yeah, I just gave you a guide. Everything above. It might be the first guide, I don't know. So, show you what the hardware is, and we're gonna to get to the next session, how threads are mapped for execution on the hardware, and we have two additional continuums. These two continuums are based on SMT, right? The two continuums is based on SMT, and both continuums just grew wider. Why? SMT8 makes those two continuums wider. That Linux on Intel stuff only has hyperthreading. There is no such reality at hyperthreading of only two. We have that additional complexity for the greater exploitation of our hardware per workload. Hold the door. We're going over to memory proportions. Uh, Joe, why don't you just go away? Uh, I don't think we're going to finish the first one. <laughs> Anyways, memory proportions. See what we do here. There's Lego blocks on the left. We're going to talk about the relative proportions of memory, free memory, and cache. We're going to get to the numbers in the next session. Let's just get the concepts and picture in our mind here on our Lego blocks. Computational memory, very important. It is the running workload. By definition, computational memory is holding the executing workload plus shared memory. And by definition, computational memory is always generated and loaded since boot. Which means when you pull the plug on the server, there's no image of the computational memory on the sand, and it just goes poof. Another name for computational memory is AVM, active virtual memory. You'll see AVM under VM stat. Free memory is used to create processes in shared memory, to support default JFS2 IO, and to spawn buffers. Okay. Typically, LRUD scans the cache to release free memory. Why do I say typically? Because paging space page outs take computation of memory and write to the paging space. That's not a good way to make free memory. You want LRUD to only scan the cache to release free memory, which is why, even if you don't use much free memory, you must have some cache because that's where free memory comes from. That's a big deal to understand that. And the cache. Cache is fading for the efficiencies of direct I.O. CIO, GPFS, ASM, R, direct I.O. And because we're deploying direct I.O. more often, we're not using the old-fashioned JFS2 buffer cached I.O. as much. Computation memory itself is divided. You've got the priority buffers of AIX. Some of them are pinned. This AIX needs some memory to run itself. User processes AIX processes, and look at that big old shared memory. It's a big Big deal. That's also data in shared memory. Shared memory holds data. In computational memory, a very nice twist versus sharing data in the cache. What? What? If you're proportioned like this and you are using direct IO, CIO, GPFS, ASM, it means you're not using the file cache as the primary data cache of licensed software. This is new age. This is old age. This is traditionally what we were. Traditionally, there was no direct I.O., no CP, I.O., GPFS, ASM, and thus what we did long ago is we used the JFS2 file cache to 
be the primary data cache license software. That means the data is mostly cached here. Today, we're hopefully more like that. Not like this. This is traditional. This originated in the era of small memories and SCSI disks. <laughs> Very different reality from today. The difference between deploying direct I.O. methods versus using the default is pivotal and profound, especially when deploying SSD flash sand storage technologies. In general, though, old software can't use CIO. But if your software can use CIO ASM GPFS, please use it. Because in 2020, for COVID, I've had so many engagements converting customers from default to CIO. And they didn't believe me, so I wrote this to throw it at them, explaining it. Okay? If you're proportional like this and you're not using it, <laughs> you, you got some long IOs. Here's what happens. If you're using the file cache as the primary data cache, you are depending on the traditional original VMM free memory GFS2 stack. What this means is the IOs come in, they go to free memory, convert to cache, and then we copy the cache into computational memory. That is the traditional long stack. Well, when the disk drives were really slow, this proportion of processing were no big deal. But now that sand storage is no longer spinning, I mean, you look at sand storage, it's, it's, it's basically huge slow memory today. This stack is proportionally a longer part of latency, so we Traditional is managing a longer path length. When the disk drives are slow, this is a longer path length. Storage comes in, goes to free, converts to cache, and then copied in. That's a long path. When we're, when we're using GPFS direct I.O. methods, we don't have that long path. Storage comes in and goes straight into private memory, shared memory directly. No VMM overhead to identify and allocate memory for it. The memory's already allocated. This huge proportion of shared memory is a big deal. When served by direct I.O. methods, these are direct I.O. methods. Direct I.O. doesn't use the old stack. The direct I.O. is directly to the private shared memory, meaning VMM doesn't have to cut any storage memory for it. It's already allocated memory. And thus, it's a shorter path length. It goes from the sand storage straight in there, bang. No use of free memory or cache. That's why we call it direct I.O. Bypass the traditional stack, less longer path length I.O. Now, this is a lesson in today's tuning philosophy. Tuning today, we know, is about sufficiency first. You have to have enough CPU, you have to have enough memory. Some people believe that's all you need to do for tuning. Well, it does work, it does, it's true, but it's not all you need to do. Tuning today also includes avoiding avoidable workload. And that's the principle by which I guide everything. If I can remove avoidable workload, everything's going to run better. But you need understanding of anatomy and physiology well enough to know what's removable, what's avoidable. And that's what I work on. Not doing something slow is ever and always faster than doing something slow. We just need to know what is that path. Uh-oh. LPAR on the right, too much free memory. LPAR on the left, yeah, about right. It's using the traditional cache. Something is wrong when you got that much free memory. In this case, 55% memory was free. So if you're proportional like that with all that free memory and you're using direct I.O., well, you got a problem. 
But if you're not using direct I.O., then maybe the cache hasn't filled up with data yet. I don't know. But if you are using direct I.O., ask the software administrator to grow the shared memory bigger into the unused free memory looking like that. If you're going to add the memory to the LPAR, try and use it. Otherwise, remove the excess, reassign it somewhere else. So, to sum, we got an LPAR proportion like that on the left, big shared memory. And you're using direct I.O. methods, you have the best proportions for responsive throughput performance efficiency. Why? You have removed much of the overhead of the AIX GFS2 I.O. stack, because it's direct. Bypasses traditional less long length. This is the standard profile of licensed software that is adapted to exploit our technology. Now, there's a whole lot of software out there that has not adapted to exploit our technology, right? And that's a bummer. All right, don't forget this profile. All right, the numbers of AIX. That's brand. And, uh-oh, they're Lego blocks again. Well, you know what that means? That's total memory. And that number of memory pages is a direct conversion of megabytes of memory in the LPAR stat dash I command. That's computational memory, a percentage. This percentage is a percentage of, of LRUable pages. That's a big difference. That's a percentage of LRUable pages, not total memory. Computational memory is that percentage times eligible pages, which maps to AVM. Always count on 4K pages. This is the real-time size of computational memory. And heads up, guys, your AVM number on every workload has a personality. You can actually watch it, and you'll see this number change every second. It has a personality. And it usually works somewhat in conjunction with free memory. Free memory. That number there is free memory when this command was executed. Free memory will keep on changing. But when this command was executed, I just look at the digits. That's seven digits free memory. Right? Free memory is also there, going up and down. That has a personality. You just got to learn it. Got to watch it. File pages, that's the hard count of JFS2 file pages in the cache. And it is the direct calculation of numperm percent times LOUable percent. 11.8% of LOUable pages is that file page count. Well, I hope that's helpful. Those are the buffers. AIX has got PBUF, PSBUF, FSBUF, lots of them. Some of them are pins, some of them are dynamic allocated, but that's memory of AIX up there. PSGUW, RSS, stands for resident set size. This is the size of processes with shared instruction images included. This is the size of processing kilobytes, and those are all cloned processes there. By this, you know, these are all processes that running the same code with different data, a little bit different in size, but they're all clones. That's what I mean. Most workloads are comprised of clones. IPCS Bravo Michael. This is the shared memory maximum allocation in bytes. What? What? This is how big a shared memory segment can grow to maximum. It doesn't mean that all these shared memory segments are full of data. You can add all that up and it adds up to terabyte, two terabytes, and you only have, you know, 128 gig around. Yeah, these will grow and shrink, but it's the maximum size. This is the shared data area. The Oracle SGA, the DB2 memory pools are in here holding data. Free memory. On Edward, free memory is 55%. Darn it. There's a whole lot of memory I had to talk to about. It. 
Three memories. Wow. Three memories bigger than computational memories. Uh, you know, the only way that happens is either you got a very small workload, a very big LPAR, or your application is upside down. You see, I like writing this syntax because it tells me so much. I, I call it the matrix effect, okay? This syntax, just by digit count per column, when you memorize the column, understand the personality, you begin to have um, understanding from these numbers, not unlike the matrix television screen showing reality, or you know what I'm saying. So uh, this is far more instructive, at least to me. Okay. Dan I.O. We look at VM stat IWWT1, and first time I saw this screen, a customer might be listening, but this is real data. I looked down and went, oh my gosh, your storage is really slow. Why? The P and W columns in the WA percentage, that's why. You monitor storage from here. Well, the P and W columns and the V column, that's not in our favorite sexy tool. Did you guys know if you don't see a problem, there's no problem? What? You have a problem, you don't see a problem, there is no problem. Wait, wait a second. That's not real logic, is it? If you got a problem, the problem's somewhere. You just got to go find it. I've given you guidelines, what I call rules of expectation on those three columns. If you're single digits, you're fine, but you're way up here in double digits, and I went, oh, my gosh. All right. I was at dirt. That's a capital D, lowercase L. Ten sets of 60-second intervals. This is just one 60-second interval. And, uh, oh, that's not MPIO. Well, that's somebody else's storage, but these numbers still fit. By the way, it's the same LPAR that's giving me these numbers, okay? So you can see that uh, those HDS powers are pretty busy. So we're going to go through these four columns. We're coming to the end of it here. Uh, percentages. In a 60-second interval, you want to be today, assuming fiber channel set storage, you want to be less than 30% busy in a given 60% 60-second interval. Well, these guys are overwhelmed way above 90%. Remember, we're adjusting to the technology of today, not the old SCSI standards. The old SCSI standard says you can be 70% or less busy, and you're great on SCSI. This is not SCSI, guys. We're on rate 5, rate 6, rate 10, a cost of fabric. So these standards have to adjust to the technology. So that there is busyness, percent time active in 60 seconds. This here is the average serve for reads. I give you standards. If you're SSDs, you're probably going to be less than 1.0 millisecond average. And then the ranges, and by which I guide them. Okay. Read max service. The longest read that had occurred in the last 60 seconds, different set of standards, less than 40 milliseconds expected. And if you see a capital S, that's a capital S there, that really means seconds, but I pronounce that centuries. And um, I, I, I kid you not, twice in my career, I found a capital M there for a full minute. And three months ago, I found the capital H there for an hour. Now, the capital H for an hour is because somebody disconnected something. But I didn't think the darn thing could tell me an hour. I'm now looking for a capital D or whatever. Anyways, if you see a capital M here, it means minutes, and minutes should be pronounced millennia, and S should be pronounced, it's a second, it should be pronounced century, okay, because that's how bad it is, especially occurring in the last 60 seconds, right? And then Q depth full, we're all aware of this. I don't know how this could be so busy and the QDEP full is zero, but when it was busy, it added the latencies in the queue. 
So it was pretty ugly in there. Come all the way back down to these three columns, BPW, and what they mean. Tom, Joe, I hope that wasn't too fast. All right. I want to comment on something with the I.O. if I could, um, Earl. So if you have a thread that issues an I.O., obviously it, it has to wait for that response to come back. If it's coming out of GFS2 file cache, it could come back really quickly. But if it has yep. to go all the way out to the disk, well, if you're seeing second response times, think about what happens to that thread on that core while it's waiting. It's suspended. And all of the context, all of the data associated with that thread, all of the instructions associated with that thread are going to be wiped out of that core. And the first thing that happens when that response comes back from the storage is that thread can't run because it doesn't exist right now, right? It's gone. So it has to be completely reinstantiated on a core to deal with the data that just came back. So you get kind of a double hit. You wait, you get the IO response back, and you don't exist in the power core anymore. That thread doesn't exist. So it has to be completely brought back in before it can run. So it goes through additional wait processes. So it's even yep. worse than just the response time. Slow response yep. time on these fast modern processors kills throughput, kills responsiveness. You see, if we have, if we, now I, I can't get this one started, Joe, because it's just not going to go anywhere, but um, <clears throat> this one here is advanced. It acknowledges that we map threads to logical CPUs, and of course, Threads migrate among logical CPUs and as well as virtual CPUs migrating between cores. What? Okay. Um, what? What? The, this is deeper, and it talks about that. So that's what this next session is. It is the first, I believe, is the first ever detailed explanation of logical CPU context switching. Because when I look up these three, it tells me it's a logical CPU context switch of a logical CPU. Thank you very much, all right? Um, but what Tom is saying is, is true. <clears throat> you see, we have so much CPU that having more CPU doesn't make the workload run faster. If we don't feed our CPUs data and instructions, it won't execute them. Where am I going? I'm stating that how busy your CPUs is only as busy as you're able to give it instructions and data. That's what I'm saying. Tuning, you got to have enough CPUs at the right SMT. Yeah, I got that. For the you right, I got that. But beyond that, tuning becomes feeding the instructions and data better to the core. Because like I said, if you don't give it to the core, it won't execute it. Today, tuning is centered on L3 cache. It's a huge statement. Tuning is centered on L3 cache. And all my tuning tactics, when needed, is about enhancing the L3 cache hit. All of us know the CPU clock cycle of power from power 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 has not increased much in speed. Is this true, Tom? We're not at 20 gigahertz yet, are we? No. No. We're less than five all along. Yet the improvement in performance from power four on to today is huge. But the clock cycle is the same. We're about. How do we account for that improvement in performance? Answer. We feed the cores better with a faster on-chip interconnect and larger L3 caches, larger L2 caches, and more cores per chip. What we've done to gain performance is learn to feed our instructions and data to our cores better. 
And those are the innovations of power underlying power. And if you watch the internal engineering from Power 4 on to today, that's what we've been doing. More cores, more cash. And next, we prefetch instructions and data into the L3 cache before an on-demand miss. What? So, Earl, let me say a couple things on that um, okay. since you mentioned it. So, so CPU uh, uh, speed peaked around power six when we hit five, maybe a smidgen over, and then it came back down seven, eight, and nine to around the three to four-ish range, right? So, so you're absolutely right in everything you said. So more cash, um, more threads, uh, more cores, yes, but our cores have gotten more powerful. Every core has gotten more powerful as well. It's not just more cores, but our cores in general are more powerful um, with, with every power. And, and that has to do with more cache, better instruction handling, more execute engines in the core, and better use of those engines. And I think Power 9 was a big use of that, uh, made big point. That's why SMT8 is so much better in Power 9 is because of, of what they did with engines and such in the core. And, and I think when we get to power 10, we'll see the same thing. Uh, yeah, except it'll be at 7 nanometers. Yeah, right. So we're going to have a heck of a lot <laughs> more of those little things inside there, the density. So you got two minutes, Earl. So so we wrap this up in two minutes and get, get uh, you know, yeah. primed up for uh, next month. Okay. Well, next month we're going to be talking about these threads. And what are the active threads? We're going to look at that CP value to identify the active threads. And it comes down to this slide. These threads on the left are those CP values on the right. This is the AIX side. This is how we identify the active workload. And then we know TIDs on the run queue are executed by logical CPUs of virtual CPUs only when it's on a core. That there is the AIX side, but this side, this is the AIX side, this is the side that we don't know. And it comes down to these traits, the traits of SMT and dispatch, defining the fragmentation of processing duration by entering awareness of dispatch. At SMT8, we've got eight logical CPUs to dispatch to the same core. At SMT2, we only had two. This number has been growing. LCS has been growing. And I'm starting to have to play with it. But before I can teach you tuning of it, I gotta teach you what the heck it is. <laughs> so I'm getting started down another rabbit hole, all right? Talk about seeding and folding and migrations, all that, that's gonna be, that's gonna be February 25th, guys. Okay, so um, let's wrap, wrap this up, I guess, with a couple of things. One, next month we continue on with Earl and, and Tom. Uh, we'll go on to the next uh, presentation that he has and see how far along we get in that when we have to have Earl back. You know, there's been a lot of questions in the Q&A um, about Linux, how this applies to Linux, and, and one now from Ron about how this applies to IBM I. Um, Earl's presentation here is, is centered around AIX. Um, I think probably Linux has uh, some things the same, some things different. Uh, I mean, some of this is happening in the core level, right, and all that, uh, the way the engines and stuff are all, you know, of course, the same with all the OSs. Um, how it's handled and all the numbers that Earl is showing is, is um, of course, you know, based on AIX. So I will try and see if I can find uh, some uh, Linux, uh, you know, performance and, and maybe IBMI performance for some different sessions. Um, and, and maybe we can dive a little deeper in those sessions as well. So um, sorry that we're, we're not really, you know, answering those Linux questions really great right now. But, um, you know, this is really just, as I kind of mentioned before, this is really an AIX-based thing. So with that, um, Earl, thank you. I think everybody's going to have to take a big breath and, and uh, a few big breaths and let this sink in. Um, the recording, I'll, I'll post the recording as soon as I can. Um, it, it takes a while for WebEx to get it set up and, and inform me that it's ready to download, and then I have to upload it to YouTube and, and get it all set up and everything. So I'll get that done as soon as I can. 
Uh, so I know a lot of people want to look through the recording uh, and download the presentation materials. But we'll all be back February 25th, right? And um, continue this on. I'm honored with your attendance, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Earl. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone. You bet. Have a good month.